Good morning, everybody. How are you doing this beautiful, sunny, warm day? Everybody doing all right? You're probably wondering about me, though. Beautiful day, wonderful day. Listen, would you all stand with me, please? We'll have, uh, in a moment here, we'll have James come with our opening prayer and welcome. But uh, I wanted to start off this day with a word of prayer. This is Ben Stillwell and his lovely fiance or financier, whatever, <laughs> Jennifer. And we're glad they could be here with us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the bountiful blessings that come from your mercies and grace. We ask and pray in this morning that today you would meet the need of every heart and that, God, you would minister grace to every hearer. May we be a blessing to this couple, and they, may they minister and be a blessing to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Bill. Thank you, Pastor. Prelude was lovely. His name is wonderful. And one of the things that makes his name wonderful is he's so powerful. He's our creator. He's holy. Um, you see it in text. Isaiah, John are just marveled at his power. So our first hymn today is I Sing the Mighty Power of God, hymn number 48 in your hymnals if you use it. If not, it's up on the screen. Baptist Church. We'd like to thank you all for being here. If you woke up this morning, you definitely knew you were in Michigan. Um, but we are grateful to have Ben and Jen with us. We had the chance to hear from them in the youth group a little bit. Um, so grateful to have them uh, throughout this day. At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for the nice weather we're having, and we also thank you for the weather that we have now. We thank you for this church, Lord, and all the people that are willing to get out on a Sunday morning and uh, come to worship you, Lord, and serve you in any way they can. I pray that you be with those who aren't, that you'd keep them safe wherever they may be. Pray that you be with Pastor, Lord, that give him the words to say, give us the hearts to hear, Lord. Please help everything done here to be honoring and glorifying to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for all the warm welcomes you guys have, have been giving Jennifer and I. I have finally found the problem with this church. You guys will just not stop talking to us. I was sitting around the table with some men, and I was not where I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be rehearsing with the choir before they came up here. It's a wonderful problem to have. 
fellowshipping with God's, uh, God's believers. I want you to take your Bibles, your copies of God's Word. We're going to do a little bit of a reading. Um, this, is, uh, this is how I work. I choose hymns based upon a passage of God's, uh, God's Word that has been laid upon my heart. Sometimes it's what I'm going to be preaching. Um, this evening I'll be able to teach a little bit from Psalm 121. Um, sometimes it's the pastor I'm working with, what they will be preaching from that morning. But um, I don't know what pastor is preaching on. And so we'll be in Isaiah 40. So please find Isaiah 40. Uh, for those of you that don't have a um, Bible with you, we have, we have something up on the PowerPoint for you guys also. Isaiah 40, verse 25. Please follow along. To whom then will he liken me, or shall I be equal? Saith the Lord, the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by, by names, by the greatness of his might, for he is strong in power. Not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God is the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? Fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail, fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. On, please take your hymnals. We'll be in hymn 511. 511. the solid rock. Our hope is built on nothing less. Why are you weary? Mount up on wings as eagles. <laughs>
Thank you for that choir. Again, thank you all for being here. If there happens to be any first-time visitors in the crowd, please grab a visitor's card and seat in front of you, uh, fill it out, and drop in the offering plate as it passes in just a little while. Just a few announcements for you guys today before we get back to some of this uh, musical blessings um, throughout this service. Uh, if you have not yet received your missionary card for the month, uh, that is the Flint Crisis Pregnancy Center, Please do so. Pick it up. It's in the same spot. This is our last day in uh, March, so we'll have a new missionary card for you next week. Um, but please add that one to your card. And remember all of them so far and all of our missionaries um, around the world in your prayers. Um, I know they would greatly appreciate it. Um, with that, the Women for Missions are still collecting baby clothes, preemie to 2T, uh, for the Flint Crisis Pregnancy Center. So if you'd like to bring them in here, the black box is still out there. It's in the corner by the fireplace, so it's a little bit hidden. Uh, but just drop them in there, and the women for missions will get them wherever they need to go. Um, as you noticed walking in, you probably smelled some good food, probably saw some good food. Um, that is for all of you, I promise. Um, but we have our fifth Sunday of the month, so we have our, um, not annual, because we have more than one a year, but we have our fifth Sunday of the month potluck, so I, we do hope that you would all stay, join us um, after Pastor gives his message. Pastor, I'm sorry you got the morning service again where there's potluck after, but that's okay. Um, but for dessert, we'll have Ben give you a message afterwards. So we ask that you'd stay for the potluck, fellowship with Ben and Jen and everyone else, um, and then stay for the service. We'll be bumped up till 1.30, so there'll be no evening service, um, but we'll have a service right after the potluck. And again, Ben will be giving the message at that time. Believe it or not, the Wild Game Dinner is about six days away, so if you've not yet gotten your tickets or signed up for food or talked to Tom about venison that you are getting, please do so. Please see myself or Billy or the office or call someone that can get a hold of somebody and we will get you what you need. Um, I know many people who um, are getting some venison from Tom have talked to him and they asked for it um, around Wednesday, a little before then. So if you have not yet talked to him or you've not yet got tickets or anything of that nature, please see me. Um, I can get you hooked up with Tom, uh, or you can talk to him. He's a really nice guy if you don't know him. Um, but he is a really nice guy, obviously. Again, we probably would not be able to have this without him. Um, he's donating basically half of everything we're going to have, so we definitely are appreciative for that. Um, but please see him. Please see me. Also, if you have not noticed yet, the ballot for the May election officers is on the bulletin board in the foyer. Um, so if you haven't seen that, um, please do so. Walk by there, get a glance of all the people up for nomination, I guess. Um, at this time, before the offering, we have a special by Tim Schaup and Carolee accompanying Sar.
Thank you for that, Tim and Carolee. If the men would come forward to take our morning offering at this time. Um, also, when we start the first verse of the next song, if the truth trackers um, would be dismissed at that time, you may do so. Brother Bob Carson, would you open, bless our offering? I get to hear that every day. <laughs> She's truly a wonderful, wonderful, godly woman. 
Our next hymn is Rejoice in the Lord. I'll invite you to please stand. The words and the music will be on the PowerPoint for you to follow along. I would rather have Jesus than anything else. We have to rejoice.
Boy, that was beautiful, wasn't it? You know, for a little thing like her, she's got a set of pipes on her, doesn't she? That's remarkable. Okay, glad you're here today. Would you turn to the book of Proverbs? The book of Proverbs, chapter number three. We're going to be here in Proverbs for just a little bit, and then we're going to go over to the book of James. And uh, I want to talk to you this morning about what we discussed last Sunday morning concerning those four main pillars that are essential to a good, healthy, strong church. And one of the first ones is stewardship, good stewardship. And you'll probably think, well, here he goes talking about money. Well, that's going to be part of it. We have to face it. Uh, You know, if you think it's such a bad thing to talk about that filthy lucre and you want to stay away from it, well, then you send it my way. I'll use your filthy lucre. I'll use the money, and you know what? So will God. That's only part of it. That's not what we're talking about today. We're not talking about the, the giving of money or our offerings and tithes to the church, though that is an important aspect of, an, of a good Christian healthy life and testimony and how we minister. There are certain things that we have to understand first, and right here in Proverbs chapter 3 tells us. We're going to start reading in verse number 5. So if you get your Bibles and follow along, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't try to make judgments of things based upon how you see it. Because you and I do not possess perfect knowledge. Only God does. You notice the song, the last song, congregational song that we sang, you know. Only the Lord knows everything that's going down. We don't. We know testing comes from above. We know that trials serve a purpose. So it's real easy for us, based upon our limited perspective, to make judgments that aren't fair. They're not fair to God. They're not fair to yourself. And, of course, they're not accurate because you don't have all of the facts, okay? So he wants you to trust unreservedly, put your full confidence in what God is doing and in his word, okay? So trust in the Lord with all of thine heart. Don't hold back. Don't try to amuse yourself or pat yourself on the back saying that I go, I walk by faith when in reality your whole heart's not in it. To avoid leaning on your own understanding and your judgment of things, you have to have all of your heart in him. And then he says in verse 6, That if we, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. To acknowledge somebody means I I recognize their presence, their, their leadership, their authority. But to acknowledge also means I acknowledge God because then I go to him and I ask him for help. I ask him for guidance in all your ways. If you would acknowledge him, he will... And here's the assurance here. He will direct your path. You cannot miss the will of God by doing this. And you know what's comforting is that we do not have to be afraid of the will of God. Now you say, well, I'm just not sure about this or that. You may have a decision to make. And you're not sure. From your standpoint, you think, well, wait a minute. (laughs) I don't think I should do this or go this way because and you start looking at the obstacles, the hindrances now sometimes God places those there and it's a help to you we understand that, I think you recognize that don't you you understand the importance of how God works in events and circumstances and in other people but don't let that alone be your determining factor sometimes you can't see the way through but God knows how to get you through. And here's a good example of this passage. Abraham in Romans chapter 4. 
I mean, who against hope believed in hope? Against all common logic and rationality, there is no way he was going to have a baby. Sarah was not going to give birth. Why? Well, first of all, Hebrews tells us she was, as far as her ability to produce offspring, was as good as dead. That means she had long passed the change of life. And Abraham, being old himself, lost that ability to produce seed. Now, that's logical. It's reasonable. I mean, we well, don't blame Abraham for realizing that. I mean, that's why he said, well, Lord, is it my, my head servant, Eliezer, my trusted servant? And, and in that custom, he could have made him the heir. Could have said, he's my son. Could have adopted him. God said, no. Well, then they wanted to help God out. So through Sarah's handmaid. <laughs> that was part of that custom and culture at that time. It would have been Sarah's, even though Hagar gave birth, but it would, Abraham would have been, he would have been son, Ishmael. God said, no, because it's in Isaac that your seed will be called. And he said, I want you to understand that it's going to come from you and it's going to come from Sarah. So here he's faced with this. Now, from his perspective, and the way he was looking at things, there is no way this was going to work. That's why it said in Romans 4, who against hope, he kept still believing and trusting that God, when he was as good as dead, and he staggered not. I like that expression. He didn't stumble around. He wasn't in doubt and uncertainty about the promise of God. He staggered not at the promise promise of God, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, because he believed if God said it, then it was going to happen. That's the kind of trust and faith he's talking about. And when you have that kind of faith, you can go and you can acknowledge God. Now, when I acknowledge God, I'm really showing him some respect. I'm acknowledging him, said, Lord, you're the boss here. You're the one. If you say so, Lord, if that's your will, if that's what you want me, okay. I don't know how it's going to work out. I, I can see no way out of this, but okay. If that's what you say. Paul said the same thing kind of in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, you know, we despaired even of life. He was sharing this experience with the Corinthian church. He said, you know what? He said, um, we despaired of life. We were in a situation we don't know. He didn't tell us what it was. Some Bible scholars surmise maybe he was talking about a moment when he and others were in the Colosseum, you know, where they put the Christians to the lions. Well, that certainly could have applied, we, but we don't know what it was. All he said was we despaired of life. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. Now, in other words, from where we were sitting... From where we were at, we knew there was no way out of this situation. There was no way out. Death was the end and that was it. We just had to accept it. But God put us in that position that we might not learn to trust in ourselves, but in him. That's what this verse is saying. So when you really trust him, you'll acknowledge him. In other words, you're going to pay the honor and respect due to God. So just, just like my dad. If my dad tells me something, I can, I can say I don't believe it and I don't like it. I'm not showing respect. Even if I may have disagreed with my dad, even if I wasn't sure about what he was saying, but I show him honor and respect that is due him, because I acknowledge, I acknowledge his authority. I acknowledge he knows more than I do. And I acknowledge the fact that he loves me and he wants the best for me. So if I pay that kind of respect and honor to God, to, to my dad, then I, I must to God. You say, well, what has this got to do with stewardship? Well, follow with me though through this text. Because he says, in all thy ways acknowledge him, he will direct thy path. Ah, verse 7 is a good key verse. It says, be not wise in your own eyes. Don't try to be too much of a smarty pants. 
Don't get cocky and think you no more. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Simply put, you fear God. You love and respect God enough. You think enough of God, you would not want to do anything in your life to hurt God. I loved and respected. I feared my debt. Well, I feared what he could do if I disobeyed. Now, that's a healthy fear, by the way. But I feared him in the sense I loved him too much. I, I would not do anything to hurt him. And that's this kind of fear, this kind of honor that we're giving to God. And that means that if I do that, I'm going to be quick to avoid anything that would cause dishonor to him. You all agree with that. And he said now in verse 8, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. In other words, that was an expression to show health to your life, just like it is a nourishment to the marrow of your bones that's vital for your life and your strength and stability. This is what it will do for you. This will make an amazing effect on your life. And then he says in verse 9, honor the Lord. Now, that's what we've been talking about. That's what these verses really are heading to. When I trust God like Abraham did, like Paul did when he was faced with certain death and just left himself into the hands of God, he gave God the honor. In other words, he gave God the credence and the respect due to him. He was acknowledging God. I can't see it. I'm not able to handle this, but you are God. So honor the Lord. Now, there's the first thing, to honor the Lord. That's what we're talking about. We are talking about something that brings glory and honor to God, right? But then he qualifies that. And he says, honor the Lord with, and there are two clauses after this that identify, how do I honor God? Well, honor the Lord with thy substance. Now you're saying, okay, with my money, with my wealth, with my possessions. That's right, that's what that word is. But you have to understand that substance is more than just physical material possessions because the term really relates to something that has substance, it's sound, it's solid. It's real. It's true. The Middle English word from this word really means what is the essential nature of something. Well, what is part of your nature? Well, you've got your life. You've got gifts. You guys, every one of you have a gift. You have skills. You each have an, have an intelligence level. Everyone has different gifts levels of capabilities and capacities to do things. Ben's got a great capacity to hit notes that I would never dream of hitting. I can hit below that bottom bass staff. I can hit below that low C. I can. I've, I can hit that A. That's an octave down below the A that's on the bottom of that staff. So the note he is hitting to me, that can't be real. Something's going on. Okay, he's got his capacity to do what he has. I have mine. We all have different abilities, capabilities that God blesses us. Well, let me tell you, what else is your substance? Your substance, you have a home, don't you? You have a family? All right, there. Do you, do you honor God with your family? Do you men honor God with your children? How do I honor God with my children? Well, I, I tell you, I found an article the other day where this guy wrote and he said, dads, take your kids to church. And he says, why? And he gave various facts and surveys that showed the difference when parents were consistent with their children in church or spiritual things. But when I'm lax and I'm not careful to see to my kids spiritual needs, I'm, I'm, I'm careful to be careful to, to take care of their physical needs. Our kids never went without food, did they? Our kids never went without clothes, did they? Now, our oldest son, Keith, he had this Chicago Cubs baseball t-shirt 
he would never take it off. He would never let his mother wash it. It was beginning to get ratted. It was decaying. He didn't care. That was his favorite shirt. He had another shirt, a green John Deere tractor shirt. And if we'd have let him, he'd probably have it on today. I mean, this kid, but seriously, he had other clothes. I saw to it that he had good clothes. They had a good education, didn't they? But most of all, when I say I want to honor the Lord with my children, I want to know, first of all, are my kids saved? Do my kids know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if they were to die today, that they could go to heaven? There's a lot of children, they know nothing of that. Now that's a sad commentary on mothers and dads that fail there. Do you realize that you have been granted the privilege of having those children in your home? Those aren't yours. Those belong to God, but he's given them to you as a steward. You see, honoring the Lord here, this is a fundamental key verse when we talk about stewardship because good stewardship starts with just how do I want to honor God? And I'm not talking about money, am I? But I'm talking about things that are my substance. Yes, it involves my possessions. Yes, it involves the car I drive the Ford pickup I drive, the Toyota my wife drives. It involves the house that I live in. It involves the bank account. Do you understand that is not your own? I've been granted a privilege to earn an income and have money and have, I, if I manage right, I'm gonna be okay. But if I'm not gonna manage right, I'm gonna be in trouble. So yes, it involves that. But substance, what is true of an essential nature that you have, that involves you. That involves who you are giving of yourself. Honoring God with your life as a steward of God. It involves your family. It involves your wife, your husband. It involves your children, grandchildren. It involves other relationships. That's substance. That's important. Honor the Lord with those essential things God's blessed you with. That takes in quite a bit, doesn't it? That means I want to honor God, kids, in school. I want to sit and I want to behave. I want to honor God by my behavior and my testimony. I want to honor God by digging in there and doing my studies instead of jacking around, playing around, and scoffing at it. That's important, isn't it? You know, you're going to need that education. Why did I take German? I took Spanish for several years. I took German. I studied German. I studied Hebrew and the Greek. Now, why German? Do I go speak German? No. Was I ever going to go to German? Well, I don't know. Someday I hoped I would. Maybe God was calling me to Germany. I didn't know. But a teacher told us this. He said, listen, you're not taking this class and the school system is not making you, making this a requirement that you have to take at least two years of a foreign language because you're going to go speak it. Studying a foreign language teaches you how to think. It helps train your brain in its thought processes. And it expands your culture and your history and your social studies. It's a subject, it is a core subject that teaches and trains your brain how to think. And that's what's important because it'll spill over into English, to mathematics, to science, to reading. All of those other factors, it's helping develop your mind. It's helping to train and discipline how you process information. That's why music is such an essential subject. Kids need to take. By learning music, maybe you'll never be a musician, but I'm going to guarantee it, it will help you be a better math student. That's been shown. Because there are skills in what's involved in chords and musical notations and counting and rhythm and things that help 
develop how your brain processes things like mathematics. It's an amazing thing. It really is. And you honor God when you decide to settle down and buckle down and listen. You're showing respect and honor to your teacher by letting them have a chance to teach you something. You're honoring them by allowing yourself to be instructed. You're honoring God today. You honor me today by giving me an honest hearing in this message. And by doing that, you're honoring God. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. That means the first and best and choicest of what you have and who you are, I'm going to first dedicate it to God. Now, there is a principle, a foundational, fundamental principle throughout Scripture of the law of first fruits. That involves, of course, our offerings and things. Yes, it does. But we're not talking about that today. But we're talking about a law of first fruits where you say, listen, because I love God, because God means so much to me, I want to honor my Lord by giving and honoring the choicest and best of who I am and of what he's blessed me with to give back to him. Because when you give to God, he blesses to give back to you so you can give back to him. And then he gives back to you and you can give back to him. That's the way it's right. It's reciprocal. That's the principle. That's the way it works. See, you're saying, first of all, I, I, I honor you, Lord, by fearing you. In other words, you've got a right relationship with God. Do you have a right relationship with God? See, it's not a hard thing for me to be faithful in coming to church. Well, Brother Burkholder, you're the pastor. They pay you. You got to. Well, but even on days where I don't feel like I, I want to go, Susan says, you got to get up because you're preaching anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. I grant that. But it's not a hard thing for me. It never was a hard thing for me. I'd made a decision a long time ago. Lord, I'm going to honor you and I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be. I want to be in the center of your will, Lord, unless I'm providentially hindered, unless I'm sick or my job requires that I have to be gone or something like that. That happens. That happens. Then I'm going to be here to honor you. A person that says that they know the Lord and they love the Lord, then they're going to love God's house. Simple, simple truth. That's all there is to it. If you say you love me, then you'll love coming to my house. See? If you say you love me, you'll honor and respect me, just like I would you. See? Same way, dads, you, you honor God by taking care of your kids and seeing that they have that spiritual training. Because the most important thing you ever want to know is not whether they get on the football team, not whether they get first place in band, not whether they can get that one intelligence prize, valedictorian, those are good things, those are good goals. The first thing on your radar ought to be, see, I want to make sure, first of all, at whatever age that my kids know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, because when they come to a point of accountability, whatever age that may be, God holds them accountable, and I can tell you what, He'll do so, I don't care what the age. If they're able and ready to know and to be saved, and I've not done something, their blood's on my hands. That's on me. So that makes me stop and think. If I want to talk about anything else about stewardship, then I've got to know that if I honor God that way, by fearing Him, by trusting Him with all of my heart, by giving generously, that is certainly, by being fair and honest. But let me show you something else about how you honor God. You remember that song we sang, Rejoice in the Lord? Testing comes from above. Would you go to Book of James with me? We have a few minutes. Let me show you, share you uh, with something out of James. The Book of James chapter number one. How many are of you are familiar 
with Greek mythology. Hmm, yeah. yeah, some of you are. Or Roman mythology. Greek mythology, the head chief god was Zeus. Well, in Roman mythology, it was Jupiter, <laughs> both the same character. One was as false as the other, but that's the way they were. Well, there was a god that some of the other gods didn't like too well, okay? Oh, but, but this god, oh, he was probably the prettiest. You, you shouldn't say a guy's pretty, okay? He was the most handsome. Is that better? Most handsome, good-looking guy. Girls might think, oh, he's pretty. <laughs> In other words, this God was possessed with the, the most beautiful looks. He was. He was gorgeous. You might say that. He had the looks. Well, the other gods didn't like that. Kind of made him mad. What really rubbed him wrong, though, is that this God knew he was the best looking. <laughs> ah, however, this God got into trouble one day. This God got into trouble because he was going out there, out in nature, out and along the countryside, and he comes by a beautiful, clear, pristine pool of water. Now, when you bend over and you look into a pool of water, Tell me, what are you going to see? Ah, he got a reflection of what he looked like. Oh, boy, did that ever amaze him. In fact, that made him like himself even better. That's true. I'll, I'll go a step beyond that. Do you know what? That he fell in love with himself. You know, a few, uh, oh, a year or so ago, there was a young lady over in England. She was so in love with herself, she married herself. Did. Maybe you read about it. She married herself. She liked herself so much. Well, that was this God. But the thing is, he was so taken up with himself. He was just so in love with himself. He didn't see the danger around him. And it came to a point where he could not save his life. And he died. He looked drowned. No one could save him. But he was so enthralled with himself, he couldn't save his own life. Now, that's kind of a sad story, isn't it? Kind of a sad ending. Okay. You say, Brother Berkeley, what has this got to do with James? All right, follow with me. James chapter number one. Now, James starts off, he's a servant. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, what he means there is the Jewish Christians that had been scattered and dispersed because of persecution. Trials, trouble. And so he wants to write to encourage them. So he says, my brethren. Now, that's a good phrase because what he says, hey, guys, we belong together. You're my brethren. I'm yours, you're mine. In other words, you know what? I'm in the same boat as you guys. I'm facing some of the same trials, the same testings that you are. That was in essence the song, Rejoice in the Lord. Testing comes from above. And sometimes it's not always easy. Right? So he says, my brethren, he said, I'll tell you what, count it all joy when you fall into all diverse, all different kinds of of temptations. He says, I want you to do this. I want you to consider this now. I want you to consider and have regard for this experience that you guys are passing through. Now, the word temptations is the same word in verse 12. Actually, it's the same in verse 13. The only thing is, is that this word can mean to test something, to try it, prove it. But it could also mean in other contexts, to solicit to do evil, to tempt to do evil. He's basically saying in verses 2 and 12, those trials, those testings, these hardships, this persecution you're facing are designed by God to prove the quality and the depth of your commitment to him and how much you honor him. 
That's what he was challenging. He said, I want you to consider this. Folks, if we are to be good and wise stewards of the grace of God and honor him with our lives as we should, with our faith, our character, our behavior, our demeanor, our attitude, our moods, then we must be prepared to have that faith and to have that character proven and put to the test. And so he goes on, he said, knowing this, knowing, here, here's a good part, knowing this, in other words, be assured and understand that the trying of your faith, the proving of your character, of your faith, that's being tried, it's going to work patience. It's going to work perseverance and endurance. It's going to prove how much endurance you have. You must understand that the working and testing of your faith and your character is going to affect a certain result and it could result in a positive rewarding experience. So Phillips in his translation says, my brethren, consider trouble as joy. Consider it as a friend because it's doing something to you. It's doing something positive in your life. The proof of your faith is going to be exhibited by your endurance and your patience and your hanging in there in your faith trusting God. The trial of your faith will bring out certain things. You know, it brings out blind spots. Because when you're tried and you're going through trouble, do you know, it begins to show you, I didn't know that ugly mood was in my, my heart. I didn't know I could think something so horrible and dirty. But he then says in verse 4, but let patience, let this process, the trying and proving of your endurance let this process finish and complete itself and let it result in you then being mature, well-developed, and strong. Now, I'm going to tell you, for you to do that, you cannot be like this God. Well, who is this God I've been talking about? Well, have you heard of the God Narcissus? Ah, that's where we get the word narcissism. Or a guy that's a narcissist. See, uh, we're so caught up with ourselves and what we think. We begin to fall in love with ourselves so much, we couldn't pass this test. See, this testing of your faith, folks, must have its working and comp it's got to be exercised. It's got to run its course to achieve the result God wants in you so that its effect will be complete and it's going to drive you to greater trust. It's going to drive you to a deeper, more meaningful communion. Your relationship with Christ is going to take on a whole new meaning because you have fallen in love with God more than you have with yourself. Do you see James, what James is, James is introducing us to a culture that has no room for a narcissistic attitude and way of life. He's saying you can't get through this if you're going to be so self-absorbed, if you're going to be so self-obsessed. That's what Narcissus was doing. He was so obsessed and absorbed with himself. He fell in love with himself. But what James is saying here, the opposite ought to be true to where you are so in love with God, you are willing to hate yourself and deny yourself and become absorbed with Jesus Christ. He is introducing us to what it means to have the mind of Christ. This kind of culture of self-denial, self-renouncing, self-sacrificing. You know, that's why it's not a hard problem for me to give. 
That's why it wasn't a hard problem when Susan and I, when each of our children were born, we brought them up to the altar and we laid them on the altar. We weren't getting them saved. We weren't blessing them. We didn't get them sprinkled and protect them so that they could be in God's grace. They had, nothing. they had to make a decision about salvation on their own. But what we were doing is we said, God, you've blessed us. I remember when my little girl was born. I always kind of thought I wanted a boy first, but I had a little girl. Susan came home from a shower. She brought home this pretty, dainty little skirt and dress. I was sold. I wanted a girl. I did. We came to the altar and we knelt and said, God, thank you for giving us her. We know that she's on loan, but you've put her into our care and we need to be good stewards and we're asking your blessings upon her life. And Lord, we're dedicating to her. We don't know what you want her to do, Lord. Do you want her to be a missionary? Do you want her to be a pastor's wife? Do you want her to be a school teacher? That's what she is. She's a school teacher. But whatever, God, that she would come to know the Lord as Savior at an early age, and that as she grows, she would live her life to please you. Well, then we had our son, Keith. Now, Keith, Jenny was a busy girl. Boy, was she busy, moving, going all the time. Keith, Keith wasn't born. Keith slid into the world through the back door. His was kind of a quiet entrance. He's, he's a captain, almost a major in the army. Good leader, but he's kind of, he's a little more reserved maybe than I am. And we did the same thing. I said, Lord, I, I don't know what you might have for him, but he's yours. Now, would you give Susan and I the spirit of your wisdom and understanding that we may raise him right to love you and honor you. Well, then when our son Josh, when Josh was born, it was in May, but I think it was July 4th because he came in with a bang. It was a hard birth. It was a hard, long process. And, and, and if I'm here in the middle and Keith's a little back here reserved, Josh is way out here. That guy has energy. He, he fits the youth camp ministry, I'll tell you that. And he, was, he always got into trouble because he constantly talked. He was a clown. He's a, he made everybody laugh. And he could look with those eyes and his teacher would just melt. And we said, if you gotta whoop him, whoop him. Because he sure gets it at home. But the same thing. I said, Lord, if you would desire to call any of our kids, but if you would desire to call Josh into thy vineyard, I'd be most appreciative. Never pushed it, never said anything to it, but there came a day. Josh came up to me one Wednesday night after church. He had his Bible in his hand, and he, he looked troubled, and I thought, he said, Dad, and he said, I, I need to talk to you. I thought, oh, now, what did you do now? What trouble did you get in school? He started crying, and he said, Dad, I don't think I'm saved. And I had the privilege of taking him into my office and leading him to the Lord. You know there's no greater blessing and privilege, folks, than to lead your children to the Lord. It's a great thing. And then the day came when he said, I, I think God's calling me into the ministry. It's a great thing. We didn't know what God had. We said, Lord, we're dedicating. See, that's good stewardship because I chose to honor God. Susan and I made a determination, no matter what. We got down and prayed, said, Lord, we don't know how hard things will get. We don't know what you're going to take us through. We don't know what kind of valleys, what kind of trials, what kind of testings. We just want to be good stewards. We want to be, Lord, we want to be in the center of your will. 
doing what's right doing from the heart being where we're supposed to be wherever that is and in the process Lord if there's some things that become difficult for us to accept and us to understand I go we went back to Proverbs 3 7 I said Lord would you give us the grace and strength that no matter what that we would keep following you and that we would keep trusting you you know what when we determine to have God honored in our lives he has never let us down. It's been a great life, hasn't it, Sue? Our kids today, are they where they should be? Well, I don't know. You know, it's, they're serving the Lord. They love the Lord and they're in ministry in some way. That doesn't mean your kids are going to automatically be called in ministry. But I'm going to tell you something. When you dedicate your kids to the Lord, that's a good way to honor God. And listen, that's at the very heart and soul of what good stewardship is. is. I'm determined I want to honor God. Do you want to do that? Would you stand with your heads bowed? Bowed and eyes closed. We got a song today. I, I thought of several songs, but I thought of this one. Uh, uh, ben, this song, page 534 in your hymn books. Guys, I want you to look at these words. Take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands. Let them move at the impulse of thy love. Lord, take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for you. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Or take my silver, my gold. Not a mite, not a tiny penny would I withhold from you. Take my moments take my days, take the trials, take the testings. Lord, just let them flow with ceaseless praise to you. Take my will. Make my will thy will. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart and it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Is that the way you feel today? I hope you do. Because right there, being a good steward, learning, learning that stewardship is how I want to honor God with my life. As we sing this today, would you let the Lord speak to you? If you have a need, let us help you here. Let us still pray with you. Or if you just want to come pray alone, whatever it may be. Listen, on this first verse, Brother Ben, come here and lead this song. And as we sing, here's a chance for you to let God speak to you and respond to his voice. Brother Ben. Make it your prayer. Make it your prayer, brother, on the last. and I hope you'll stay uh, for our dinner and time and then of course the afternoon service Ben will be speaking tonight and um, hearing them another special uh, from Ben and of course Jennifer I'd like to have Ben and Jennifer would, would you guys go to the back doors there we'd like people to, to greet you as they go 
I'd like to have Brother James, would you come up here and close us in a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessings too as well on our food. But I hope you'll stay and I hope that you'll have a wonderful day in the Lord as he leads us in prayer. I'll just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day that you blessed us with. We thank you for the message that Pastor brought before us, Lord. Uh, we pray that um, even for those of us who don't have kids, Lord, but that we would all uh, devote our lives to you, that we'd give our lives to you in a special way, Lord, that we would take that song and truly apply it to our lives throughout this week, Lord, and then throughout the rest of our lives and pass on the good news as well, Lord, so that others may may live in that way as well. I pray that you'd be with this time of fellowship, that you'd uh, give all of us a good time, that we'd get to know one another, get to know Ben and Jen. Pray, Lord, that you'd bless this food to our bodies and our bodies to your service. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.